We're back on the Ringer NFL show. Ruiz, Sam Darnold, and the Vikings go to Green Bay. Jordan Love plays, and the Vikings just jump all over them and win that game 31-29. What did you see? What a strange game. Like, this score is both misleading and not misleading. Like, the, pa- the, the Vikings blew this game out, and it wasn't super competitive. I know the Packers, like, stormed back and almost got back into it, but it never felt like the Vikings were going to lose this game. But if you go back to the first quarter, this game really swung on two dropped passes. There was a drop on third down. It was kind of a bad throw by Jordan Levin. There was a drop of a Sam Darnold pick that preceded the opening drive touchdown. If you reverse the results of those plays, I don't know. Maybe it goes in in Green Bay's favor. Maybe they're the team that get out ahead 28 to nothing and, and the Vikings have to come back. But I think my main takeaway is that out of all of the, the people involved in the Vikings this year that could be – picked as their MVP, whether it's a coach or a player. It could be Kevin O'Connell. It could be Brian Flores. It could be Sam Darnold. Justin Jefferson's still the heart and soul of this team. He's still the best player on the team. He's still what this offense is built out of. And we saw how the gravity affected Green Bay's defense early on, where they were throwing a bunch of double teams on obvious passing situations. And that was opening things up for Addison elsewhere on the field. And that's how the Vikings scored their first two points, or first two touchdowns. They had huge plays where Jefferson's getting doubled or getting extra attention, and another receiver makes a play. And then you saw the Packers adjust in the second half, and they started taking away those extra bodies. And that's when Jefferson came up with Two remarkable catches. His his touchdown catch is one of the greatest displays of concentration I've ever seen. Like the ball ricochets off his shoulder pad, off the Packers shoulder pad, the (laughs) the Packers defender shoulder pad. And then he catches it with his right hand, with one hand, he pins it against his chest. And this all happens in maybe 0.5 seconds. These, these four ricochets, like a double doink off of, uh, the, the pads of the players, and it, it's an amazing catch. And then he seals the game with the catch, I think it was on third and 11, where I don't know how he got those two feet down, but you saw both ends of his skill set. Like you saw the physical contested catch, and then you saw the acrobatic sprawling catch. And then throughout the game, you just see him, you know, doing everything else he does well. He's a great route runner. He can he can make those 50-50 catches. He can make those acrobatic catches. He can beat double teams. He can beat single teams. He's good against man. He's good against zone. He's like the ultimate weapon and the ultimate receiver. And I think if you take him off this team, the story totally changes with this offense. And as we've talked about before, you never want the coach or the offensive coordinator where it's like, why isn't a player like that? getting the ball, you know, and you never really have to worry about that with the Vikings. So their coaching staff, I mean, obviously it's Jefferson's talent, but their coaching staff deserves credit too. He had six for 85 and a touchdown on eight targets in this game. And like you said, they were doing things to take him away, but you can't, you know, you can't make it easy for the opponent to just take a guy like that uh, away. So Deontay, the, the Vikings jumped out in this game, 28, nothing with about six minutes left. In the second quarter, the Packers come storming back. Packers had 465 yards of offense, but had four uh, turnovers. What else did you see in this game? What stood out to you? I mean, to me, a lot of this, this comes back to game script again. I think that really this was, and we talked about this in the Friday show, this was always going to be a rough opportunity for Jordan Love to have to walk back into, you know, a starting opportunity in the league of seeing Brian Flores. And then I think you saw early in the game, they landed in a lot of second and 11, second and 12s, third and 15s, third and 20s. And I mean, you're just not going to succeed against Brian Flores under those circumstances. And then when you have those poor bounces of the ball, a throw behind the receiver in the second quarter, to your point, talking about when the game got away turns into a big interception and that just about felt like it sealed the game and that's not the only one of its kind um but ultimately and this comes back to what Steven was saying I mean my biggest takeaway echoes his sentiments you know for all the talk about two high defenses and you know wide receivers being a premium position and etc etc about the passing game it's so rare to come across guys that have legitimate gravity on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. And when I was watching Justin Jefferson, that's one of the few guys that's like got Steph Curry level gravity because Jordan Addison is able to step right into right and right back into a starting, a starting role. And you get him targeted, you know, targeted opportunities in the red zone. You're able to find him deep downfield. And all of that is only possible because of what Kevin O'Connell and Justin Jefferson are able to do within this offense. 
outside of that, I mean, the second half got really weird on the Packers in, you know, they were able to kind of pop some of the explosive plays that they couldn't get at all in the first half. But, you know, to Steven's point, I think that the final is probably misleading if we're talking about the flow of the game. By the time the Packers got it together, they were clearly Minnesota was clearly one good possession away at all times from putting the game away. I will say this about Jordan Love. I know he threw three picks. It was very Favre-esque. But that's how your quarterback should play when you're down 28 to nothing. You should be willing yeah. to put the ball in harm's way. You should be making those YOLO throws. Like the only reason they were able to get back in it was because Jordan Love was so reckless with his decision making when throwing downfield. Like it's honestly commendable. And the, like there are other things that could have swung this game. Their, their kicker misses two field goals. Yeah. And they're not like super long field goals either. It's like 39 yards fun. and 47 yards. They could have easily made those. That totally changes this game. So. I mean, I'm not too depressed if I'm I'm a Packers fan after this one. I know this the the start was bad, but I thought Jordan Love came into his own as the game went on. And I think the other positive thing to take away from this is that knee injury, even though it was clearly bothering Love, it didn't prevent him from being a downfield explosive passer like we've seen with other quarterbacks. Like in in Cincinnati, we've seen Joe Burrow really take a hit when he's taken a lower body injury. We've seen it affect the Chargers passing game with Justin Herbert nursing a high ankle sprain, but with Jordan love, like it still seems like deep passes are still on the menu in green Bay. I would have loved to see Malik Willis in this game go up in, against Brian Flores, but I think it would have been ugly, yeah. especially if they fell behind early. <laughs> yeah. All right. This feels like a good spot for a, like what is real check here. Okay. Because the Minnesota Vikings are four and oh, they have beaten in three straight weeks, the San Francisco 49ers, the Houston Texans, and the Green Bay Packers, three teams that could all potentially be playoff teams. Kevin O'Connell, Brian Flores, incredible coaching job. The Packers are 2-2, two and two, but to your point, Jordan Love came back, maybe wasn't 100%, but threw for 389 yards and four touchdowns against Brian Flores. That's not nothing. I know, like you said, he had to just take chances, but it was only sacked once. That's an encouraging sign. They survived without him. They're still in the mix. So Ruiz, get look into the crystal ball. Like, do do you believe that the Vikings are close to this team? Like, is this a team that is going to win the NFC North? Uh, potentially, I guess, compete for the one seed in the NFC. We got to say that they're four and zero. Or do you believe more in the Packers as that type of team to win the division? Oh, yeah, it's hard to answer just because they have this big margin of error to work with. And I want to believe in this Vikings team. Like, I love Kevin O'Connell. I, I love Justin Jefferson. I like this this run game. I love Brian Flores. He's my favorite defensive coordinator in the NFL. But the quarterback is still the quarterback. And Sam Darnold showed once again, he still got that bozo in him. And he nearly <laughs> threw away the game in this one. And they had a 28-point lead. He nearly What did threw- he do in this one? He threw a pick and he fumbled in the fourth (laughs) quarter to let the Vikings get back. And he almost threw an interception, as I mentioned, on the first drive that would have taken points off the board again. Like, I I think when he gets into one of these moments, he's going to show who he's been and who he who he will be going forward in his career. I'm not totally buying the turnaround. You're leading Packers. I can tell by the tone. Yeah. Okay. So you're leading leading Packers because I think they have the coaching staff to match Minnesota's coaching staff, not necessarily on the defensive side. I would take Brian Flores over halfly every day of the week, but Matt LaFleur is probably better than Kevin O'Connell at this point. It's, it's arguably close. The difference is one team has Jordan love and the other one has Sam Darnold. So I'm going to go with Jordan love, the more talented quarterback and the more trustworthy quarterback, which is odd to say about a guy who I just compared to Brett Favre, just who three. just threw three <laughs> touchdowns. All right, Deontay, uh, I've been, I just keep waiting. I've been like, all right, this is going to be the week. Sam Darnold is, he goes 20 for 28. Yes, he, he, you know, he had a couple uh, turnovers, but he was making some nice throws in this game at 275 yards, three touchdowns. I haven't gotten fully on board. I've been Mr. Packer since the preseason, and so I'm not going to jump now, although I, I'm just very impressed with what the Vikings have done so far. Where are you with these two teams? I would say they're legitimately good, just not 4-0 and good. And, and to okay. Stephen's point, they've bought themselves a nice amount of margin for error when Sam Darnold does turn back into the Sam Darnold we've known him to be over the last half decade plus as a starting quarterback. But when you look at some of the things that will maybe not be so stable, right, and I think a lot of that for Minnesota is on the defensive side of the ball. 
Um, for you know, as many turnovers as they forced, I think that they're only second to Green Bay in interception rate so far this year. I think they're top ten in sack rate. So these are things that you would say, like, hey, on a week by week basis, variance will probably tell you this will even out. You might not be as successful, even given the fact that they blitz a bunch. But you think about the fact that they're winning and still giving up explosive plays. Right. So if they found a way to be successful, despite giving up, you know, 20 plus yard uh, completions at about an eight percent rate, which is top 10 allowed in the league or bottom 10 allowed in the league. And they've still looked good defensively. To me, that tells me that this is just more kind of locked into who they are identity wise and less about them just kind of riding the lightning on a week by week basis. Right. I think that if turnover luck kind of goes the opposite way on the offensive end, you'll see things maybe kind of even back out. But for the most part, what they're doing and how they've been successful feels sustainable to me. The run game feels sustainable to me. Getting the ball to Justin Jefferson on early downs has been sustainable for them for as long as he's been a Viking. And I don't plan on that. I don't imagine that changing. And I'm sure that they don't plan on it changing. And having Jordan Addison back healthy, I think, kind of evens out the roles with this wide receiver room. Getting uh, Jalen Naylor more as a wide receiver three and not having to rely on him when Addison is, be, or excuse me, when Jefferson is being double teamed. So while I don't think they're contenders because of who's starting at quarterback for them, I think it would also be foolish to ignore what they've accomplished over the last two to three weeks mm-hmm. and say that they're not a good team. I would say that they are good, just maybe not really four and oh good the way that we would conceive of an undefeated team at this stage in the year. Yeah, I think the one thing you have to buy is not only the infrastructure of the the offense and the coaching staff, it's how good this defense is. That's the one thing I'm not really going to question because especially in a playoff environment where it's like heavily game planned, we are attacking the specific things you do. We're not trying to establish a program in a way of playing defense throughout a 17 week season. We are focusing on what you do. I trust Brian Flores to at least give the offense a chance. Even if Sam Darnold has a meltdown game in the playoffs, I think they'll have a chance in every game they play in the playoffs. I do think they're, demise will be authored by the quarterback though. Oh my gosh. I just picture the Vikings fans listen to us go, hey, 4-0. Hey. We got the most impressive resume in hey, the NFC. Vikings fans know better than anybody how this ends. Sam Darnold, 4-0 in London, going to face off against his former team, the New York Jets in week five. What a story from the early season. All right, we'll take a break. Come back. Get to one more big takeaway. 